Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, December 24th, 2020, Christmas Eve. And I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it very much. All right, guys. Well, whatever you're celebrating, uh, if you're celebrating uh, Christmas, uh, you know, have a wonderful time. I hope everybody has peace and love and happiness in their lives. I'm going to be working myself, so <laughs> work Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And somebody's got to, so um, might as well be me. But whatever you're celebrating, Hanukkah or Robonica, like uh, Bender on Futurama or Festivus for the rest of us, whatever you're celebrating, uh, please do. Have a good time, be safe, and uh, get together if you can, because that's an important thing health-wise, as far as I know, you know, the love of sharing love with, with others, that's an important, healthy aspect of our lives. So, in any case, um, well, I thought for um, the video here that I'm doing at Christmas, we do something a little bit uh, on the happy side because so many of the stuff I cover is very controversial and can get quite depressing, especially when you feel like, you know, you can't really get your message out properly maybe or though maybe people you know understand what exactly what you're saying but you know they can't seem to break free of whatever their mainstream views might be or even their alternative views as they're led to believe so you know my channel is sort of dedicated to um approaching these issues from different perspectives so you know i hope that you understand that, you know, much of the stuff you're going to see on maybe even the History Channel or on TV or on YouTube or whatever focuses on these um, particular things. Um, and, you know, I'm here to say that those things are rabbit holes and they're meant for you to go down and waste a lot of time there so you don't really see what the truth is. And... I've talked about it and I've gone through great lengths on my channel to dispel this notion that the giants were some of these uh, sort of bloodthirsty, savage beings, uh, you know, of all different kinds of variety, you know, natural and supernatural, whoever they may be. And uh, to just these vile, reprehensible monsters and everything like that, where most of the evidence so far suggests something completely different than that, that these, you know, rather large people and large hominids, humanoids, whatever they might be, might have been, were very sophisticated, you know, very uh, intelligent, maybe carried some of the knowledge from a previous past more um, advanced civilization. Um, they seem to have, you know, knowledge in mathematics and engineering. And, uh, you know, if it's true that the Iroquois really are um, the descendants of the Hopewell or, you know, the remnants of the Hopewell and they took from Adena culture these uh, things from the big man there, the great peacemaker, you know, if they took these things from them, then that would make them extremely sophisticated on a social level side of, uh, you know, having this sort of democratic society with women seems to be a matriarchal society that ran most of the things and these, uh, you know, men carried the names of the women, you know, so it's just, um, you know, seems very contradictory, you know, these, uh, you know, the can whole cannibalism story is just a demonization of an enemy are we capable of it certainly we are so you know the stories of the bible i read the bible and you know um you know i read the story in the old testament of you know when uh, jason uh, you know um joshua was you know sent to go to the city to where you know they seemed you know like they were you know grasshoppers compared to these giant 
people there, and they were sent there to kill them all, and all of them, including all the women and the children, and even the animals, too, you know, you read this story, and you're like, what? Well, you know, what'd they do? They, did they do something wrong or something? You know, they don't really explain that at all. Just that, you know, God said this, I guess, according to Moses, who couldn't go there himself because, you know, he got angry in the desert there and struck the rock and got the water out of the rock, and God didn't, didn't like that too much. So, he, you know, he couldn't get in there for some reason. But, you know, guys, like... You know, my friend Bill Donahue from Hidden Meanings in the Bible, this most hated man in Christianity, you know, thinking about him at this time of year, too, because he's the most hated pastor in Christianity because he explains the Bible in a way that you can understand, you see, a way that makes complete sense. But in order to do that, you have to sort of suspend all the ideas that you ever had about the Bible, you know, you know, suspend those beliefs because, you know, what you hear Bill say here, who, I, you know, I've corresponded with him a number of times, he's a beautiful man, a lovely man, and, uh, you know, just incredibly knowledgeable about the Bible, can crow quote, you know, scripture and verse and everything else, backwards and sideways and upwards and downs, but you've never heard anything like this. Most hated man in Christianity, 99.9% .9 of other Christian sects, whatever they are, hate Bill Donahue because of what he says about the Bible. He's sort of like a Santos Benucci there of, you know, Christendom. But if you never heard his stuff, I have a playlist on my channel. I love Bill, and I love, you know, he makes total sense in the Bible. And once you hear what it's about, and, you know, none of these people ever really existed, but it's still a very important book, you know, and it's, that's hard to fathom right there, right? So, but if you never heard about him, he, you know, he's another one of these guys who say, well, why did Joshua go in there and kill all the giants for anyway? There's no reason for it. And other people have talked about this giant genocide, which might have started or the hints of it that was going on in the Bible, at least in those times, right? Maybe, right? We don't know the real time uh, line in the Americas anyway. If we're going by their stories, all right, but it seems that all the evidence about the Giants is quite contradictory to what even the alternative, you know, what either you're mainstream and you don't believe in the Giants at all, or, you know, you're alternative and you believe something like L.A. Marzulli, Nephilim, and the Nephilim are really the Anunnaki because they come from, you know, um, Nibiru and all this kind of other stuff. You know, I don't know, but, you know, it doesn't seem to be any direct evidence for anybody. There's a lot of stories and stuff like that about it that have no evidence to back any of that stuff up. Whereas the stuff we're talking about on this channel here on these actual accounts and what can be gleaned from that and the many ages and epics of the giants that pass and everything, I mean, that's as far as much as we can know, right? I mean, at least, you know, that part of it, you know, we, but the, this other thing with Anunnaki, you know, we just speculate into, you know, oblivion about it, you know, just, there's no evidence for any of that stuff. And, you know, what I think about UFOs on this channel, I don't want to go into it, but, you know, look, folks, let's, Let's talk about things that you never heard about on this cha channel. And one of the things that you might not have heard about is the good giants, okay? I've talked about the good giants, and we know about Gilgamesh, right? And we heard about, and from accounts that I've given here on the channel, including King Mangotuxi out here by the Montauka guys, he was a great man and everything. He's one of these big men, these uh, Goliath-sized guys who was digging million dollar canals over here somehow with deer antlers and straw baskets which i find hard to believe but you know not that he didn't do it or anything but you know something else was going who was doing it there's evidence of it there i mean you know where they have big dredging machines or whatever how did he do it with uh, bare hands and for what purpose you know you know 
receive giant ships there. They would have canoes and so you need a thousand foot, you know, artificial harbor for there. Just ridiculous. But in any case, we heard about all the chiefs actually during historical times I've read to you about on this channel, you know, accounts of these rather large chieftains in America so might showing the last vestiges of the giants, but actually they, you know, they seems like they all lived into modern times and just the whole story is hidden from us. But again with the good giants and it just and there was a couple of Native American, uh, one of these giant chiefs of tribes and went into historic and even to modern times where, you know, it's like beloved by all the people in town and just their demeanor was just, you know, uh, just lovely and beautiful and peaceful people and everybody in town loved them because they were just such saints and all this kind of stuff. and. You know, it made me think that maybe these people who were, they said, were the giants or whatever, really just the opposite. And that's, you know, I believe everything that you hear is a psyop and a rabbit hole. It's got to be because it's, you know, all in the mainstream. Even the so-called, quote-unquote, alternative stuff, which it really isn't. You know, it's just more contrived nonsense for you to waste your time with instead of concentrating on what the real story could possibly be, you see. So, what if these giants, okay, had their demeanor, their natural demeanor, you know, the DNA dictated were rather peaceful and, you know, sophisticated. They somehow didn't eat the land animals, this may be where the Native Americans get all their reverence from, you know, you appreciate these animals for their superior, obviously superior skills, and some of their skills and talents and everything the animals have are just superior to ours by so many degrees, it's just incredible, you know, their eyesight, sense of smell, hearing, abilities, whatever they are, we pale in comparison to them but you know as i've said many times if you have large land populations um how fast is it that you're gonna over hunt your area right if you don't have domesticated animals to depend on it's just wild animals you could over hunt your area in a second it seems like all the ancient cultures of the past lived along the shorelines of the world anyway, where you have the bounty of the sea is just never ending. There's many times you could throw a net and you get food, right? So many of these people with seafaring cultures, as I've said on this channel, the um, and I've covered it, you know, I've covered all sorts of mainstream research, and this is by William A. Ritchie, who was head archaeologist of uh, New York State for many, many years, and it can, Dr. Ken Fader knew who he was when I spoke to Dr. Ken Fader on Coast to Coast and made a fool out of him, right? He knew who he was, okay? William A. Ritchie was doing these digs, and he found often in these, uh, you know, uh, these artifacts and among them were these giant harpoons not spears harpoons okay went way inland in new york state okay but well, we have giant lakes like lake george and lake champlain and all kind of stuff in new york state these giant lakes we might have been bigger in the past maybe all right with all kinds of weird animals from the holocene living in there until they died out so you know, you have seafaring cultures, and in fact, you know, the, the meat that you eat from the creatures of the sea is different in consistency with the meat of land animals, okay? It's just don't want to get into much dentistry or whatever, but if you read about it or whatever, you could see the difference in the quality of the texture of the meats and how it can ruin your teeth. Land animals or red meat can ruin your teeth. So certainly this whole cannibal issue goes astray. It's very sophisticated. You know, they had their children and their wives and their grandparents and uncles and aunts and everything else to worry about this thing and you know the people living in a city in the bible they had a joshua who killed everybody in there seemed very sophisticated too i mean it's just you know people living their lives or whatever it is just getting wiped out for no reason okay so where else could there be friendly giants? So, I, you know, I'm pretty soon I'm going to cover more countries in Europe and in, in my uh, part two of my series on a quote-unquote giants or large hominids, okay? 
these countries in Europe where there's some oddball accounts here and there. I got a big kitty cat looking at me right now in the back there. I feel bad for him. I don't want to give him food. But he go away. This chicken over there he ate. But in any case, you know, I'm going to cover these countries in my part two of my series. And I was looking into the Frisian giants that we would find in Holland. And there's these stories about this Frisian giants. Okay, and one guy in particular, this Pierre Gerloff Donia. Okay, so it's very interesting to me about this fellow who lived in historic times and how he's described and what we know about these people who live in that area today. And we'll take a good look at it. We'll actually take a look at the geography there and ask some questions there too. But let's take a look at this for a second and just talk about it a little bit. I'm going to get into those probably next week before New Year's, uh, you know, my next video or, or I'm going to do... Um, Maybe Italy, I'm not sure, but let's talk about this, okay? So, this Pierce Gerlach Donia from this place in, you know, Dutch guy in Holland there, was a Frisian rebel leader and pirate. He's best known by his West Frisian nickname, Groot Pierre, Big, Big Pierre, or by the Dutch translation, Groot Pierre, which referred to his legendary size and strength. His life is mostly shrouded in legend based upon a description now attributed to Pierre's contemporary, Petrus the Borata. The 19th century historian Conrad Buskin Hewitt wrote that Groot Pierre was a tower of a fellow as strong as an ox of dark complexion. Which I find fascinating, okay? We're always like, you know, all these, all these, you know, Caucasian giants and everything. Who's to say what the pigment of their skin was? Even Harry Hubbard says you can name a, a half a dozen different pigments these people could have had, you know, whatever they were. I'm just saying, you know, I may have Caucasian skeletal, you know, uh, anatomy, but, you know, who's to say what the color of their skin was? So, in any case, this guy was of dark complexion broad-shouldered with a long black beard and mustache, a natural rough humorist who through unfortunate circumstances was recast into an awful brute. See how that is? Out of personal revenge for the bloody injustice that befell him in 1515 with the killing of his kinsfolk and destruction of his property, he became a freedom fighter of legendary standing. So a very upstanding guy in the history of these people in, in uh, Friesland over there. Okay, and they talk about, you know, who knows if any of this stuff is right. They don't give much over here. And they talk about battles, but read down here by super, superhuman strength and size. In 1791, Jacobus Koch wrote, Koch wrote that above the porticus of the new city hall of Leorden, two remarkable large swords were found, which were said to belong to Groot Pierre and Wizard Jelkama. Donia was noted for the ability to wield this great sword so efficiently that he could behead multiple people with it in a single blow. Today, a great sword that is said to belong to Pierre is on display at Fries Museum in Leorden. It measures 2.13 meters, 7 feet in length, and weighs about 6.6 .6 kilograms, 14.6 pounds. Pierre was alleged to be so strong that he could bend coins using just his thumb, index, and middle finger. Some sources put Pierre Guerrero's height at 213 centimeters, almost 7 feet. A huge helmet said to be Groot Pierre's is kept in a town hall of snake. Okay, so I'm not going to read any more about it, except that, you know, this is what they're saying about it. You know, this is probably, you know, the last vestiges of giants that we're hearing about in modern times. Although I said that, you know, they live, they're, they're here still in modern times, but their story is just not told. And I feel so bad for this kitty. He's looking at me like... <laughs> See, I track kitty cats here. I, you know, I maybe, you know, I got to give it something to him for Christmas here. I hope he stays here till the end of the video here because I'll give him something. So anyway, isn't that interesting about this guy here, this uh, 
this uh, Pierre guy, and it just that he was of dark complexion and as strong as an ox and seven feet tall. And here in Holland, in this Friesland, where they, you know, they speak their own language, this Frisian language there, one of these native languages that is not an Indo Indo-European language. And, or, you know, it's just scarcely related. And what about all of this stuff? So, this is what, you know, where Friesland is. Here's an old map of it. And... Let's talk about these people in Friesland, okay? Because it's just interesting what they say about them here. And these these islands that are off the coast here, in Holland here, where Friesland is, okay, just so look so artificial. And I think um, you can see it here, the islands here, actually, on a Google Maps here, they traced out here, and then, you know, when you look at it on satellite view, it seems, you know, like these were, you know, maybe dry land at one time, but they seem artificial, and, you know, I don't hear them calling them artificial, but they certainly look artificial to me, and as I said, you know, Here's what they look like on that old map there, and it just and they look like they're artificial. So let's see what they say about the Frisian history here. Frisia has changed dramatically over time, both through floods and through a change in identity. It is part of the Nordwest Block, which is a hypothetical historic region linked by language and culture. The Frisia began, began settling in Frisia about 500 BC, though recent farming settlements have been dug up, which dates back to 2300 BC, hmm, which may contradict that Frisians have settled only in 500 BC. Hmm, you think so? According to Pliny the Younger in Roman times, the Frisians, or it may be their close neighbors, the Chalcy, lived on Turks. Man made hills. Isn't that interesting? Man made hills. Well, aren't mounds? man-made hills so our turps mounds so they show this man-made hill seem like a platform mound kind of okay so art is an artificial dwelling mound found on a north european plain that's been created to provide safe ground during storm surges high tides and sea or river flooding the various terms used to reflect the regional blah 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 so you know you read more about it but it seems like so many of these mass in some of these sort of um swampy areas in the americas were similar in that respect although they don't call them turps but they certainly seem like these turps Okay, so, okay, so, it's Frisia at this time provides the present day uh, provinces of Frisia and North Holland. So, and Frisia, according to the sources, the Frisians lived along a broader expanse of the North Sea or Frisian Sea coast. Okay, so, these people seem to go back into antiquity and are probably not from the times, they say. They say that the Vikings, this is interesting over here to me anyway, along the lines that I'm always talking about, how trade works and all this kind of stuff. So, listen to this. All right, all the topics that I cover on my channel, I can try to get people to understand that this is how it is. All right, just saying how, you know, Frisia went back and forth among these people. And uh, the Frisia Magna was partly occupied by, this is the main Frisia Magna, it was like the main um, place there. And it, it seems like fantasy realm when you read about these things, like uh, J.R. Tolkien, and, you know, just smacks of that so much. The Frisia Magna was partly occupied by Vikings in the 840s until they were expelled between 1885 and 920. It has also been suggested, read right here with me, okay, for the people on my channel who have been following along with, the, you know, these sort of factual things that I seem to talk about on my channel that don't have anything to do with these crazy romanticized ideas of these cannibalistic giants running around killing people, all this kind of stuff. And it has also been suggested that the Vikings did not conquer Frisia, but settled in certain parts, such as the island of Wieringen, where they built simple forts and cooperated and traded with the native Frisians. 
One of their leaders was Rorik Odorstad. So I keep on saying when they say they find Viking stuff here in the Americas, especially up here in the Northeast or, uh, you know, evidence of the Celts or evidence of the Romans or evidence of the Egyptians or evidence of the Phoenicians. Okay, this is what is done with trade. I'm just trying to tell you, okay, you know, you just have to take it down from those lofty ideas of the Nephilim and the Anunnaki and Come back to Earth, okay? Let's talk about all this other stuff, okay? We talk about that stuff later, okay? This is not evidence that concerns itself with that at all or anything like that. It's just down to Earth, so, all right? So, where they build symbol forts and cooperated and traded with the native Frisians, okay? Sort of garrisoning of the area over there. This is what this is probably talking about when we talk about the Americas here and how all these people from the past were here doing business, okay? That's what the world is about today. That's what it was about in the past. That was about what's in ancient past. That's what it's going to be about in the future, okay? This is how it is, okay? And saying you don't have to worry about, the, you know, star alignments and all this kind of other stuff. Just keep business moving and all this kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about spiritual things and blah, blah, blah. He's got all this other practical everyday stuff going on and people run their lives just like everybody that ever lived. Okay. So just think about these things when you think about the Americas as well. What were the Vikings doing here? It was the same thing. All right. Built simple force, cooperated and traded with native Frisians who weren't being colonized or, you know, there's going to be troubles and it's the Vikings knew that too and, you know, to keep it nice, man, and everything's copacetic, see? We can all get along, right? So, in any case, and here's a little picture of Christmas there and Rockefeller Center there with the tree and everything. Is everybody wearing masks there? I don't know. But let's hear about some good giants here because it seems to me that the people in Friesland there, the Frisians there, the Frisians who have been there for centuries upon centuries, let's read a little bit about them and let's, let's get it back down to earth, let it, a little bit down to reality. And we're going to read this article here about these people here who are probably the ancestors of these giant people. And let's hear about what their real demeanor is like. Look, even if you're a peaceful people, so whatever you are, you're still going to have to defend yourself. You're probably still going to have to learn martial arts of some sort or rather or something, you know, to try to defend yourself, right? You need the basic tools, the living tools are often converted right into weapons or whatever. This is how it is in the world. So, you know, no different for the giants as well. So this article is from May 24th, 2019. And it's a, really a travel article, but so it's even better than, you know, a historical article or something like that. Somebody trying to make some point there or something like that. But seeing from this sort of, um, to me, seems to be just a sort of happenstance um, connection here between a travel blog and, you know, a travel blog and this sort of article that's written about visiting these places in Holland or whatever, and, you know, the legends associated with those, historic legends associated with those places. So let's hear about the real people who live there, you know, who are probably the descendants of these large hominids through this article here. And I think you're going to be fascinated by what is said here. And I think this is showing, uh, you know, this thing from this Disney thing, which I believe was a truth drop. From uh, the Friendly Giant, 1986 here, and I guess maybe it was redone, I don't know, but in any case, it seems like, you know, it was redone by Disney and when, a 20-somethings, rather, this character here that they're showing over here, so I think it's a truth drop in mainstream here to really tell us who the giants really are at the same time, assuring us that they're totally make-believe, but who they really were, okay? So let's read this travel um, article here, and I think you'll, you're going to be um, fascinated by it. On the edge of land and sea, where it is difficult to tell what is land and what is not, life is rough. 
The corrosive salt of the sea is devastating to most land species, hence the near treeless landscape of the flat tidal marshlands of former Frisia. Vice versa, most living things in water cannot cope with the sea that turns into land twice a day. Only the weirdest of species can survive in this twilight zone. The same is true for the strange-looking humans who dwell in this environment and the topic of this post. Hmm. Contrary to what most people think or expect, the biodiversity of the Wadden Sea is not rich at all. Only around 10,000 different species live at the Wadden Sea. When one focuses on the tidal environment, only about 5,000 species can manage this extreme habitat. When you compare this to the 36,000 species more inland from the Wadden Sea coast, this is a poor score. The flip side is, however, once a species has managed to adapt to the harsh environment, competition is limited and there's food in abundance. Therefore, the numbers of species present are huge. One cubic meter wadden sea mud contains millions of diatoms, thousands of small crabs, mussels, snails, and worms, the reward of living on the edge, and these diatoms all look like UFOs under a microscope. It's that interesting. What about the humans that learn to live in the twilight land? Putting behavioral aspects aside, inhabitants of the Wadden Sea coastal zone are odd creatures indeed. They are actually giants. If you don't believe it, just Google or Bing tallest people, quote unquote, and the Netherlands invariably rank as number one of our planet. The average height of men in this small country is a staggering 1.83 meters and of women 1.69 meters. But that is not all. The men of the Wadden Sea Coast, i.e. provinces Friesland and Groningen in the north of the Netherlands are on average two centimeters taller than their fellow countrymen to, of the south. The women are even on average 2.4 centimeters taller than their competitors of the south. So the tallest people this planet has ever seen live along the coastal zone of the Wadden Sea. I didn't know that, and now we know that, and isn't that interesting? We talk about these tall crusaders here in a little little note here. Already in the Middle Ages during the Crusades, the Frisian fighters, together with the Danes, were described as the tall big men from the north. Read our blog post, Foreign Terrorist Fighters from the Wadden Sea. Maybe those days with a bit more temper than today. Furthermore, if you look to their features, you will notice somewhat long pale faces, exceptionally long and gangling arms, somewhat curved shoulders, often big ears and noses, always huge hands and often blonde hair. Needless to say, the latter might also be the result of a salty environment which bleaches their hairs. You could say, taking everything together, they look a bit like that like that other seaman, Popeye, and who does not want to look like Popeye. Well, I, you know, somebody said I look like Popeye um, just recently, you know, because I have no teeth and, you know, um, I said, well, why not, man? You know, t you know, we all know that Popeye's like one of the strongest guys that ever lived. You know, when he eats his spinach, he gives everybody a beat down, you know. So it's pretty cool to be Popeye. Those readers who have been in to the north of the Netherlands before and stepped into a local bar in, let's say, the villages of Wamels or Birum, they may might have felt impressed and unsecure to be surrounded by giants. To order a beer means the bar counter is at your chest level, at the very least, and they do not even bother to go to the men's toilet. Impossible to reach it unless you take a crutch with you or have one of the giants to give you a lift. Ask them, they are used to helping out smaller people. Above that, the giants also make a lot of noise when they drink, which you cannot decipher either. But don't fear, they are all really as big and as friendly as their dozy, hornless, Holstein Friesian cows. As to why dwellers of the Wadden Sea region are so tall is still unclear to biologists. Isn't that interesting? It's still unclear. That's right, it's still unclear. 
And, uh, you know, you can hear more about that on my channel in plenty of videos. Of course, it is genetic and food has some influence too. But why the feature height became such a strong gene in the evolutionary selection process, they haven't figured out yet. Have Frisian women maybe a preference for tall men? And if so, why? It is tempting to simply suggest that the dwellers of the tidal marshes literally had to keep their heads above the water during the many great storm floods. And if not during the storm floods, tallness was needed to stick out of the suck sucking mud of the salt marshes and more inland out of the treacherous fenlands anyway. And with their big hands and long arms, they endlessly dragged and moved heavy clay to strengthen, repair, and heighten their turps artificial dwelling mounds and to build and enforce their dikes so you know that lots being said there you know these uh, mound building uh, giant peoples okay who lived in these dwelling mounds okay maybe remnants of you know peoples who uh, you know survivors from the mound building cultures building these mounds right Okay, maybe mounds were not only um, for burials or maybe never for burials at all. Just later generations of giants used them for that. You know, who knows? Okay, we don't. But it's interesting, okay, with their big hands and long arms, they endlessly drag and move heavy clay to strengthen, repair, and heighten their turf. So it's interesting when I say the giants were you know, experts at doing certain kinds of stonework, et cetera, et cetera. Well, here they are doing work with clay. It's just element from the ground, whether it be clay, gravel, sand, you know, uh, terra preta, or these other engineered soils that are used for mound building purposes or whatever it is. These are what these giant people specialize in. I keep on saying it's so a one thing can progress to the other, okay? Maybe the earliest cultures started with mounds or with dearth structures and then they developed into stone. And these are the people who carry those traditions, okay? And here's evidence of it. It just, you know, it seems like a circumstantial evidence of it, all right? And if you think, okay, so um, for many centuries, it was a tough competition because if you wanted to survive, you had to move more soil than the seed did. That's very interesting, too, okay? Bigger peoples move more, well, don't they? And if you think because of this history that people have a somber view of life, you will be surprised. Although the people of Province Friesland belong to the poorest of the country, only behind their eastern cousins of Groningen, and have one of the highest unemployment rates, they turn out to be the most happiest of the Netherlands. This according to the repeated statistical research of Central Bureau Bureau de Statistic 2017 on a free social plan bureau 2019 the Frisian paradox as it is called too and the Netherlands ranked number five this year in the most happiest countries in the world behind Finland Norway Denmark and Iceland World Happiness Report 2019. Indeed, the Frisians are a cozy bunch of friendly, happy giants. When we look at the Nord Frisian in its most northern state of Schleswig Holstein, where already since 2013 the happiest people of Germany live, Deutsche Post Book Atlas 2020. In other words, just like the other 5,000 weird-looking animal species of the twilight land, humans had to adapt to extreme circumstances too and have therefore their own peculiarly particularities as well okay but i think it has a lot less to do than that and more to do with in a history that they're keeping from us and we don't know anything about about large hominids that lived in the past and large hominid civilizations and more advanced civilizations of hominids of every variety genetically enhanced peoples who in their society genetically enhanced themselves and ended up as cavemen when they were destroyed by some catastrophe and now you had all of these uh, physically engineered, biologically engineered peoples into all these weird shapes, sizes, forms left to fend for themselves in the wilderness with nobody having any way of restarting civilization at a level like that immediately for, you know, millennia.
All right, I'm just trying to tell you what most likely to do. I'm just taking guesses at it, but why not me? Nobody else is talking about it. In 2018, the Giants of Royal Deluxe visited the province Friesland. The Northerners were truly amazed and still talk about it because for the first time in their lives, they saw creatures that were taller than themselves. Note 2. This blog post focuses mainly at the at the descendants of Mid-Frisia, i.e. the provinces Friesland and Groningen in the north of the Netherlands, it would be interesting to have more data on the heights and tallness of the people living along the Wadden Sea coast in the states Niedersachsen Nieders and Schleswig-Holstein, Ostfriesland, Dismarthen, and Nordfriesland in Germany. If you have any additional data, please let us know. So they're looking to get more data on this stuff, but isn't that fascinating, this whole story about the Frieslanders here and how they're so happy and they might be poor and unemployed and all this kind of stuff, but their demeanor seems to be of, of rather peaceful. Okay, so... Let's say all the giants that ever lived were like this, and the giants of the past are somehow were different than us from that in those respects. And maybe because we are genetically engineered by these people who lived in the past, whether they be giants or not, or just somebody who lived in this past with a more advanced civilization that designed all these things and set up like. Um, uh, Jared uh, Murphy there on uh, Conflict Radio, uh, writer and researcher, says that it's just one big biological computer. The Earth is one big biological computer set to run, but it has somewhere strayed somewhere off course. And, you know, it's just running on, you know, just a couple cylinders now or whatever it is because, you know, we've interfered, you know, by our lack of knowledge of our history and prehistory and everything else and about the possibilities of what there could have existed in the past, you know, we don't know how to manage it well now. You know, we've had all our guesses and everything, but, you know, profit often outweighs any sort of rationale. So this is our problem as well. You know, we taught all these things are great and terrific and wonderful, but they aren't, in fact, not great and terrific and wonderful. And, you know, it's just funny, you know, we're going to, you know, whatever holiday you're celebrating now, we're so, you know, maybe just selling the, um, the change of the new year, you know, from one year to the other by the gr Western version of the Gregorian calendar here. It just says above, you know, everybody's learned to accept in the world, you know, who cares what your system is, you know, we're going by the Gregorian calendar because we're so obviously adept at, you know, our history and everything, which is a joke. I mean, almost want to crack up hysterically even in saying that. So we're following the Gregorian calendar, which is, you know, it could be just a complete, total um, farce. But I just wanted to talk about this, the Frisia Coast Trail here article because of the way they talk about these people being so um, happy and friendly and, uh, you know, totally in opposition to what we would expect giants to be, where they live now or then, you know, the way they depict them in this, in, in in um, alternative is these Nephilim or Anunnaki or whatever it is, these bloodthirsty giants just, you know, it seems so creepy and, you know, monstrous and everything else. You know, these are rabbit holes that want to take you away from these good giants and what the past could have been and more advanced societies of the past in this whole timeline and story. We're just supposed to believe they're from outer space or fell out of heaven and made it with the angels and all this kind of other stuff without any real explanations of what the history and timeline could be of this planet, right? So I hope you found it interesting and sort of uplifting, really, to hear about the giants. And, you know, hey, you know, maybe my research is, is right on the money, folks. Okay, I'm trying to wean you off the History Channel ideas and L.A. Marsuli and all these other 
old 20th century ideas you have about the giants and we're moving on into a new understanding that helps us understand more of the past before we even get to Nepaline or Anunnaki there's some completely no evidence for that whatsoever and this whole cannibalism story is us you know we're punks is what we are we're just little punks and when we want to do to the enemy, when we want to demonize the enemy, we just say whatever about them. They're bleeding blood, kidnapping little babies, or, you know, whatever it is, we just say whatever it is, all lies, okay? It incites people to get angry, and that's what the political leaders want and the people in their societies. They want this obedience out of them. They want this on their knees, slavery, you know, praying to the political gods and going out and doing the warlike and savage and barbarous things that these people want to do. And these are the people with the bad genetics in our uh, society who want to do all these horrible things and don't understand, you know, apparently this worldwide race of uh, large humanoids that possibly lived in a more advanced society in the past were more advanced socially and tried to impart that upon us possibly being their subjects for many millennia, okay? Which it's, that's, it seems that this is what the evidence points to, folks. All, we cover all this stuff on my channel. All the stuff that you read in textbooks is pure theory, pure hypothesis, pure, you know, nonsense and fantasy. All the things that L.A. Marzulli and all these other people talk about, complete fantasy nonsense that they make up, you know, based on whatever is said in the Bible and all that kind of stuff. So, look, think about all these things. Think about this actual stuff here that we can take from what goes on right here, the evidence of the giants in modern times, in our present times. It's just it's something that's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. These giants survived into even into our times. There's elements of their DNA still kicking around the planet, and they just have no explanation for it, and they're going to leave it at that. They, that's, they just say, well, we don't know, and uh, that's all there is to it, right? All right, guys, anyway, I hope you liked that video, and uh, please do think about these things. If you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe, because, uh, you know, we're not following all this other stuff. We're trying to get at the truth here, and I think I'm, tr I'm doing a good job trying to provide it for you. Um, I probably would have a lot more subscribers if I just talk about cannibalistic giants and Anunnaki and Nephilim and UFOs or spaceships and all this kind of other stuff. I would have thousands and thousands and tens of thousands more subscribers and I can make up all kinds of stories about them and suppose all kinds of things about them. But none of that stuff would be any closer to the truth than, you know, um, you know, uh, Goldilocks or, you know, any sort of children's story. All right. So anyway, guys, thanks a lot. Have yourself a nice holiday, um, and, you know, throughout the, all the holidays here. And I'll see you next week probably for another video. All right, guys. Anyway, peace.